Oh, good evening, everybody. My name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design. I would like to welcome you this evening uh, for a lecture called Making Places, Designing for the Non-Traditional Media Canvas. It is a pleasure to announce that tonight's program is presented in association with October, New York's Architecture and Design Month. So, have you ever seen installations of motion-activated media walls, digital windows revealing unexpected views, or architectural lighting that changes with the direction of the sun or speed of the wind as you come near a building or walk through a lobby. Our guest speaker, Michael Schneider of ESI Design, is here to highlight case studies of his recent interiors projects that have captured the public's attention and imagination. As an interaction designer and audiovisual technologist, Michael is an integral part of ESI Design's creative technology team. Michael brings a strategic approach to the creative implementation of interactive AV technologies for a wide range of client projects. He draws upon his extensive expertise in interactive systems, interaction design, system design, and assistive technology to create innovative solutions for projects such as the Shanghai Corporate Pavilion at the 2010 World Expo, the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the U.S. Senate, and the Enterral Place in Washington, D.C., featuring 1,700 square feet of motion-activated digital displays. Prior to joining ESI in 2008, Michael created innovative work for a broad range of institutions, including the American Museum of Natural History, Staten Island Children's Museum, and Sydney's Museum of Contemporary Art, where he was also an artist in residence. In addition to his design work, Michael has taught at the School of Visual Arts, New York City College of Technology, New York University, and the Cooper Union School of Engineering. Prior to receiving his master master's in interactive telecommu telecommunications from NYU's Tisch, Tisch School of Interactive Telecommunications program, Michael completed a two-year apprenticeship in Korean traditional folk song in Seoul, Korea. What a way to end an introduction. Yeah. <laughs> so, without further ado, Michael, it's all yours. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Um, really exciting to be here tonight. Thanks for coming out. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, designing for the non-traditional media canvas. Um, and so before we, we jump into talking about designing for the non-traditional media canvas, I want to set uh, a few definitions, uh, give a little context uh, to compare um, uh, what, what we've been working on to what's really out there. So I want to start by talking about what is the traditional media canvas. So traditional media canvas um, are the things that are all around us. They're a, um, they were invented almost 100 years ago. The TV, a nice little rectangle that sits there. Um, it is about this big if you're sitting on your couch, and it's about this big if you're holding it right in front of you. Um, you know where you're going to be standing. It's never too bright in that environment. It's never too dark in that environment. And there's approximately, uh, I think about $8 billion worth of content created for it every year. Billions and billions of dollars of content created for this rectangle. Um, so. Uh, we know this medium. This is a very, very traditional medium, and there's a huge industry surrounding creating content and generating uh, your experience for this little rectangle here. So not only do we know this rectangle, but we also know how to make things for this rectangle. Whether it's Flame or After Effects or any of these tools that we use to create content, um, there's a giant industry supporting this creation. And the interesting thing about this industry is that you're working in the medium for your final output. Right? You're working in pixels for pixels. And so if it doesn't look good on your screen, you can change it. You can re-render it. You can move things around. It's, a, it's, um, it's rapid iteration that you can do uh, on this canvas. So what's a non-traditional media canvas? Well, at the simplest, a non-traditional media canvas happens when you just turn it 90 degrees, right? That $8 billion of content that's just sitting out there that's been developed with all of that, uh, those amazing tools really can't be used for this because it just doesn't fit on that screen. And 
uh, the, the screen on my desk, the tools that I'm using, they're not meant to be creating for this. So all of a sudden, not only do you not have the content, but the tools are now all of a sudden abstracted from the final output. So this in the simplest form is a non-traditional media canvas. In a more complex form, a non-traditional media canvas could look like this. Uh, this is the project that we worked on in Washington, D.C., the Terrell Place, which is that project with 1,800 square feet of uh, motion-activated wall with integrated LED that changes and shifts to the ebb and flow of people through the space. So we now know what traditional is, and we have some examples of non-traditional. So why would we want to create non-traditional media canvases? Um, so in this day and age, people, I would say everybody, it doesn't matter if you are 10 or if you're 75, uh, you've been engaging in your social, in your work, in your lifestyle, uh, you've been engaging in digital societies, right? Whether it's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just surfing the web, you're engaged in a dynamic digital space, a space that when things change in your environment, it changes too. There's a constant uh, dynamism to the, the digital space. And um, we're at this turning point where everybody is so used to that dynamism in their connections with the people around them that I think what we're seeing is that when you walk into a physical space, and that physical space isn't changing with you, that frankly there's, a, there's almost a disappointment to it. Right? When you enter into a community digitally, your community gets bigger. Right? You're connected to more people, more opportunities. And very often when you walk into a physical space, your world gets smaller and is the same as it was 20 years ago. So I think that um, uh, it's one of the big shifts that we're seeing is this desire for, for the things that we interact with to be more dynamic. And, and I actually think that, that selfies are a really great um, uh, symptom of this because what, what am I doing when I take a selfie? I'm taking my physical experience and I'm putting it into my digital world. Right? This is like that first moment where I'm getting, whew, thank goodness, I can now get a little bit of my physical life into my digital life. And I think people are really satisfied, are starting to get satisfied with that, um, that transition, that ability to mush between physical and digital. Um, so we have to make our walls talk. Um, the, the traditional answer to making our walls talk is putting some TVs on the wall. And that doesn't work for a number of reasons. Uh, I think that the biggest reason is that these things move at the wrong speed for a wall. Right? A wall isn't supposed to change every 10 seconds, but a TV changes every 10 seconds or quicker. And so what happens when something changes every 10 seconds or quicker? You really have two options. You either leave your physical space and you move into the TV world, in which now you've gone somewhere else, or you ignore it. And those are really the two options. Uh, a lot of times these TVs are used to give you some information, but realistically we all have a little device in our pocket that gives us much better information than the TV on the wall is going to give us. So um, while this is the, the first response to trying to make our walls talk, this is the wrong response. Um, so uh, this, is a, um, this is a space that we worked on on, on 47th Street and 5th Avenue. It's the old L'Oreal building. Uh, and this is what it looked like before. And we have these spaces all around us that very deliberately cut us off from the world around us. These are lobbies and spaces where you went into this building to, to, to get away from the masses, to get away from the chaos, to be in something that's, you know, it's a mausoleum. It will be there forever. Right? You go and it's got this like gravitas. Um, and that's, that, that was OK. Uh, but but now I don't think it is okay anymore because we don't want to go to the place of work and feel cut off from everything that is around us. We need to go into a space and feel like going to this space clarifies the things that are around us, connects us to the things around us, and makes us feel like we're part of a dynamic environment. So in this building, 
uh, we, we reclad the, the lobby with these beautiful marble panels. And then we pretty much took a, a vertical, a horizontal slice through the whole lobby, stretched the lobby out 18 inches, and put in a digital window that looked out onto Midtown here. And we created all this beautiful custom footage shot off the roof of the building that enabled you to see the, the, the excitement of Midtown and all of the things that were happening. And as the sun set and the lights of all the windows, these beautiful square windows that go on into infinity to come on, they actually form the last five days of the Dow Jones S&P. And so there's this beautiful play of the uh, the vigor and the excitement of Midtown with actually giving real-time data of the energy and the um, productivity that's happening all around us. So here you see uh, the, the real-time graph of uh, the last five days of the Dow Jones that just kind of rise out of, of this shot, this beautiful shot of Midtown. Um, this is the, the lobby at Terrell Place in DC before uh, we did any work to it. And uh, there's been a lot of studies showing that, that boring buildings, boring environments really cause unproductive work. Uh, that there's a real, um, there's a need to always surprise and delight and engage people in their spaces. And if those spaces can offer that surprise and delight, it creates a, a vigorous and exciting work environment. So, we, uh, we invigorated this place by, um, it, was, it was a really challenging interior situation where there was what, four buildings that had been uh, kind of non-conventionally glued together and all these strange corridors. And so we turned all of these corridors and all of these walls and, and, and pathways into a dynamic environment that, uh, that interacted and changed with the movement of people through the space. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing in our work, especially in the commercial space, is that you have companies, big tech companies like Google, that are creating these really amazing environments for their employees. Places that don't just offer you work, but they offer you uh, all the amenities of life. They offer a place that's, that's vigorous, that has community, that has opportunity. And then on the other spectrum of things, you have co-working spaces like WeWork, where, again, they offer uh, a vibrant community that's bigger than just uh, your place of work. In buildings like these that we're working on, where most tenants are a half a floor, or one floor, or maybe two floors, that size company isn't really able to offer their employees that same sort of uh, excitement and amenity space. And so by really activating the, the public amenity spaces throughout those buildings, we're able to offer an amenity that all of the, um, the offices, it's a shared amenity that all of the offices throughout that building can really engage with. So fun, delight, surprise, uh, a way to engage with uh, the community that you're in. Um, and, and so not only do we do this in, in these types of buildings, uh, we also do it in companies like eBay. This is a project we did in the, in the eBay campus in Silicon Valley uh, where um, they had just split from PayPal and had to kind of reinvent their sense of community and their sense of identity. And so we worked with them to design their new town hall, a whole new building that incorporated the live story, the live data story of all of the things that are going on in eBay from uh, what's, the most popular, uh, what's the most popular search on eBay right now? What, is, uh, what are the different CSR, corporate social responsibility activities that are eBay are doing right now? Uh, what's the highest selling car right now? And so it's a, it's a place for both the eBay community and all of their visitors to come together and understand the identity of this company and also help build it together uh, with the company. Another space that we're seeing this happening is in the retail. This is a, a picture of a mall that I actually just came back from last night. Um, and uh, this is a, it's a, it's a upscale mall in Chicago. Um, and it's getting emptier and emptier and people aren't coming to this space because there isn't a dynamism to this space. If there's nobody in the mall, it's empty. 
There's no motion, there's no activity. There's nothing that makes it feel alive. And so um, I, I'll show you a, a pre-visualization of what we're working on there, where we've actually uh, activated the entire ceiling of the atrium and are able to blow the ceiling open and show the sky, have birds that dynamically fly through the space, uh, and really incorporate the culture of the, this mall space at a very high level, at a very high touch level uh, throughout this entire uh, space. So it's, it's a way to really engage people in the space and then also create an attraction that draws them in. So we've talked about um, some of the why it's happening. Uh, we've looked at a few examples. We've defined what non-traditional canvases are. And then I'm just going to show a few things that are happening in the technology world that are allowing this to happen. My background is in the AV technology side. And I think that uh, for me, it's exciting to see how our medium is really expanding to support this type of work. Uh, so one of the, the first things that uh, we'll look at here is it's a simple technology. It's been around for a long time. It's projection. It's what you're looking at here. Um, but projection traditionally is not good in permanent installation. It's a ton of maintenance. You have to change the lamp every couple months. It's expensive. Every time you touch it, the projector moves. Um, they've just come out with some laser projectors. And laser light projectors will last five years and never have to be touched. They can even last for eight or 10 years. Um, and so this is an installation we did in Chicago, where we've got 13 laser projectors all up above the soffit, uh, working in this, this neoclassical lobby that was built in the 80s um, that's filled with marble and nobody wanted us to touch. And so instead of actually touching the marble, we just turned it into something else by doing this projection mapping across the entire surface and activating it with dynamic stories uh, from the neighborhood, from the Chicago uh, culture, and from the building. So a very exciting uh, evolution of technology. Another technology evolution is the, the super high resolution LED. So one of the challenges with technology in space is unlike the TV in your house or your phone where you always have it at the same distance, this screen here needs to look good whether I'm standing one foot from it or whether I'm standing 300 feet from it. And so as uh, LED gets higher and higher resolution, it means that we can now get close to, closer to it and it can be a, a pleasing and comfortable experience. This is a project we did in, in Denver where we activated an 85 foot tall wall with these five vertical stripes of LED. And so again, this is a place where just the, the cost and application of this technology enables us to really cover a massive square footage of, of material and activating it um, with very uh, defined uh, moments of, of very high resolution technology here. This is a piece where uh, each one of these different pieces is always changing based on the environment. Uh, these different trees shift and blow in the breeze depending on the direction of the wind. Uh, we have moments with uh, the birds that flock. And these are all algorithmically generated birds. So they're always flocking differently. And the background shifts and changes based on the, the color of the sky outside. So it's something that uh, changes and responds to its environment. And then this is uh, an interesting example down at, at 85 Broad Street, um, down in the Wall Street area, where we're actually using a, an LCD, a screen like this, except it's totally transparent when it's showing white. And so we get to start to play with a three-dimensional physicality of the actual technology. Right? We're so used to a technology being two-dimensional. And if you really want to engage at the architectural space, you need to start engaging in that three dimension. And so in this case, we have uh, these beautifully routed out maps of old lower Manhattan, and then these dynamic media uh, pieces that lay, over, lay on top of it and craft and pull out different stories from the map that's below it. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities that we see when we're working in this space, because uh, unlike traditional media, where there are all of these existing tools that have been around forever, and there is a known canvas that you're working for, 
we're in a really exciting position where we get to both invent our medium and we get to invent the content and the story that goes on it. And so we'll look at a couple of those uh, challenges there. Um, so again, this is the, uh, the building down in Washington, D.C. This whole wall here, you, when you look at it, you can see that the cherry blossoms uh, blow in the wind as people move through the doorways, uh, as people walk by. Each one of those cherry blossoms grow and bud more, and eventually the petals blow away in the wind. And so it's an entire dynamic system that's always shifting and changing. I'd say one of the, um, the biggest things to understand when working at this scale is about speed of movement. We're so used to working with technology that's at a very, very fast pace. But the materials around us here, our physical materials, don't change at that speed. And so if you're walking by a wall, and that wall all of a sudden changes, it's very disconcerting. Um, and so when we think about architectural speeds, we think about um, you know, the speed of my shadow on this wall as I walk by or the speed and the change as the sun moves across the sky and puts different colors across the space. And so it's really important when dealing in, in architectural space to really understand the right pace and speed for the scale that you're working at. Uh, really thinking about what is the human speed and what is the architectural speed. What's the ebb and flow of that space? And how is it different uh, during rush hour times and during uh, times of more calm. Um, so these are a lot of the things that we need to think about. As far as the content goes, uh, I like to think about content in a couple of different ways for a piece like this. I think that there's something that is uh, environmental content. It's content that connects the building to its community. So in this case, down in DC, cherry blossoms were a really core part of, of this building's identity. And so these cherry blossoms change and, and grow depending on the seasons. They change and grow depending on the flow of people through the space. Then there's, um, there's content that's about the, the dynamism of the space itself. So in this, what you're seeing here are these generated color swirls that move and shift as people move through. And this is really about activity of people in space. And so it's a direct human connection there. And then there's informational content, which you can see in the background here in the elevator bays, where we actually have a high-res screen that pulls live feeds from, from Twitter about social topics that are happening around this area, where the best trending food is around this area in DC, um, what's going on in, uh, in the local events. There's a, a big uh, stadium right across the street. So pulling stuff that's much more informational. And so understanding the layers of these different types of content to create um, a really, a space that has a, a clear defined identity. Um, another challenge is really understanding uh, the environment. Right? So again, when we talked about a traditional canvas, it was in a very defined environment. It's in your living room. It's never too dark. It's never too bright. You're never too far from it. You're never too close to it where when you go into a physical environment, uh, this, this place in, Washington, in, uh, in Denver, you can see that from 300 feet away. And so how do you give a compelling story from 300 feet away that's also compelling right up to it? Uh, what you're seeing here on your left um, is a, um, it's a uh, mountainscape of the, the Rockies that's made out of Instagram photos from different photographers and artists uh, throughout the Denver area. And so from 200 feet away, you see this beautiful uh, Rockies uh, uh, image. And then as you walk up to it, you see each of the individual Instagram photos come out, and you get to see all the details of those. And so thinking about all the different levels of scale and detail. Audio. Audio is a wonderful challenge. Um, and it's a challenge because uh, how do you put audio into a space that people actually spend time in, uh, that doesn't get repetitive, that's not too loud, that's not too soft, that um, resonates with the physical space that it's in and appeals to everybody's taste? That's impossible. Um, but it's such a core part of our human experience is having the information 
given to multiple senses. This is something that we're seeing, we're seeing the rhythm of the space, but if we don't hear it, it's not being reinforced. There isn't, um, there isn't that satisfaction of getting similar information on multiple senses, which is, I think, really core to human existence. And so one of the things that we like to do when we, we think about audio is figuring out where are the spaces of transition. Uh, in this space here, each of these long corridors was filled with audio. And this is dynamic audio that was actually sourced from uh, songs and music that Mary Church Terrell, the, a very prominent civil rights activist that this building is named after. Um, she has this amazing memoir where she talks about the importance of music in her life. And so we worked with a, an amazing sound artist who took those, stretched them out, built all these layered and complex uh, audioscapes that are tied to the movement of people and the movement of the media and always shifting and changing. But they only happen when you move in through these hallways. And so it's this, it's this really great moment in this space when you go from the main lobby and you step into the hallway and now you're surrounded by media, visual, audio, and we've even integrated with the lighting system there. So all of the architectural lighting shifts and changes with the, the media as well. Um, so audio is a real opportunity. It's a real challenge. Um, but if you can get it right, it really creates a much more satisfying experience. You'll see it's so sad when it goes away. Right? <laughs> like, um, now it's just an empty room and it's dark. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about process. Uh, so we talked in traditional media, you've got great tools out there. You've got uh, you know, After Effects and Flame and all these really cool, amazing tools. Um, we're starting to see some really exciting development in the tools that we can use for creating these types of environments. In the last year and a half, two years, uh, we've shifted a lot to using VR for uh, understanding what these spaces are going to feel like and work like. And I, I have to admit, I was resistant. The idea of going digital to understand physical was anachronistic to me, and, and I've been sold. Because um, a rendering of a space is a very, very deliberate view where you're either seeing a detail or you're seeing a wide shot. And you really don't understand context or scale or any of those things, which when you go into your little black mask there, uh, you really get those things. So this is a, an example of, of going through a VR of that eBay space that you saw earlier. And it really allows us to, to understand, you know, is this screen too big? Is it going to make me feel like a small human being uh, if when I walk up to it? And you figure out, no, actually, it doesn't. Or can you see down the corridor? What's your view down the corridor of that screen? So all of these um, uh, understanding viewing angles and perspectives and scale, while it's not perfect, um, it's, it's really amazingly good at uh, enabling you to do this. And then you can do quick changes. Um, you know, what happens if they all go to a darker color or a different shape? And you can see how it affects the entire space. And so it's really become a core part of our toolkit in understanding how to design for these uh, non-traditional environments. Uh, it also uh, allows us to try out some of the interactivity. We have brought on an amazing developer who creates actual interactive experiences in the VR. And so we can uh, dynamically engage with those environments. And then here you're seeing how you can actually see when the sun is going to be shining on that wall and when it's going to actually affect your experience of that space. So we do uh, use VR quite a bit. That doesn't mean that we don't get real fast. Um, so this is an example of uh, early mock-ups. Mock-ups are core to our design process because you've got to get your hands on the medium. Uh, this is a shop mock-up where we were looking uh, for Terrell Place in Washington, D.C. How much resolution do we need? What's the diffusion going to look like? We taped out the whole space. We said, this is what it looks like from the street. This is what it looks like when you're standing at the front desk. This is what it looks like when you walk by it. And we, uh, our whole design team goes, looks at content on this. We bring the client there. And they say, well, yeah, I think I'm willing to spend an extra X dollars to go with a higher resolution. Or you know what? We don't need it because we can really tell the story with a lower resolution. And that lets us really understand 
um, the core medium that we're going to be using in designing for these spaces. We then drag that mock up into the real space. Uh, I think this is a really interesting example because once we brought this on the real space, uh, not only did it uh, help sell this idea to all of the stakeholders in the client team, but we also realized that this floor was way too shiny. And, uh, and we needed to hone the floor so that you're not standing in a, in a pool of water reflecting the, uh, these cherry blossoms. And so understanding how technology actually works in the physical space and how it interacts with the physical space. Um, we, we looked a lot at lighting design and figuring out how you can make sure that everybody looks good and healthy standing in front of a giant screen. These are all the things that you have to really think about uh, because otherwise you end up with a bunch of blue people and nobody likes blue people. Um, so we, uh, we test the technology on space. Uh, then the other part that we do simultaneous is we don't think about our media as these uh, pre-rendered, here's a video, put it on the wall. Because this is a space that has to change, it has to be dynamic. And so we really think about designing a platform. Uh, something that can uh, take live input from the weather, uh, from the stock market, from, the, from Twitter, from Instagram, from, from the movement of people through the space and can shift and change with it. And so what you're seeing here uh, is kind of our dashboard for creating these particle systems and all of the different knobs and parameters that we can, uh, we can turn and adjust. This is our palette for, for creating this space. And so while we have this palette for creating this space, this platform, we also look at it in a live visualization. Again, we can walk through this, we can understand the scale, we can play with interactivity, and it lets us start to put together uh, our understanding of what this real space is gonna look like. The last piece of that is we actually bring the, the mock-up into our office and we create this little suite with that previs, uh, with our toolkit, and with the, mo uh, with the technology mock-up that eventually becomes the real thing. And this is what uh, our design team will sit around for weeks at end and really uh, tweaking and changing all the parameters, understanding what we're gonna have to change once we're on site to get that final speed right, to get the color right, uh, all those last tweaks that we need so that when we spend our two weeks on site as lobbyists, uh, we can put together this, uh, this beautiful and amazing piece. Um, so uh, it allows us to be iterative. It allows us to be reactive. It allows us to have a, a set of tools, a toolkit that really uh, enables our whole team to make all those decisions on site, to really make it a piece of art to make it something that uh, instead of having um, multiple layers of information that are, are, are separate, it allows us to have depth and detail in the, in the world that we built in that space. Detail that the people in the space come to appreciate as they walk by every day and they, they find that little butterfly they've never seen before, or they realize that when they stop and they're talking on the phone, the blossom blooms and the, the fills the whole space. And those are, the, those are those moments where people start to feel ownership and connection uh, with their spaces. So I think with the right tools, uh, with this new process, and, and I think with the, all of our shifting expectations for a, a more dynamic and exciting space, I, we definitely have seen this surge of opportunity for creating these non-traditional media environments uh, where we start to really align our, our digital and our physical spaces that are really creating a, a new uh, dynamic and social community hub. And, and it's really exciting. And uh, thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes open here for questions, if there are any. Yeah. I have one. So how do you, I mean, the bottom image there is so interesting because the digital wall is so, so luminous, mm -hmm. and the regular materials seem drab. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, how are you exploring mm -hmm. working with interior designers with the other materials? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, it's actually it's an interesting example. This is an IMP building. Um, and this 
entire niche, it was this, uh, originally it was, I think, a gallery that there was places to hang uh, paintings that had been taken out many decades ago, and it was just this dark niche. And so what we did here is we actually um, are using reflected light that's reflecting off the concrete. And so you, it's, it's probably the photograph more than anything, but the light actually brings to life all of the detail and the patina in the existing concrete that's uh, 40 or 50 years old, and it, it activates the whole space. Um, so I think, um, you know, depending on the work that we've done, there's times where we work really closely with the interior designer, and uh, the whole story continues from the media out to the carpet and through all of the um, furniture, and we do, um, we work on all the signage and wayfinding, and those are the moments that are the most satisfying and the most uh, consistent. Uh, I think there's other times where there's a little bit more separation, which are still good, but it's, it, they, there's, it's not as continuous of a story. But I think that it, it, it takes, um, you know, like in this space, we did work quite a lot with a lighting designer to reimagine how the lighting in the whole space works so that um, you don't have contrast. I think that's something I, I didn't talk about that much, but brightness, uh, typically when someone puts a, an LED screen on the wall, they turn it up bright. And so what happens is you see it as a, a something that's almost assaulting you. It's like it's, it's, it's forcing its way into your brain. And I think what we do is we really think about, okay, what is the light environment of this space and how do we meet it? How do we match it? So it just becomes part of that environment. It probably doesn't show as much in the photograph, but I think in these real spaces, you'll find that uh, there's a con continuity of, of experience across all the different mediums there. Yeah. Uh, in the space, the Terrell space and the Denver building, yeah. are you using LED panels? Uh, and also, what type of computer software are you using for the pre-biz and also for the content? And have clients asked you to change the content over time? Yeah, um, so yes, it's LED. Um, in Terrell place, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I'm, Personally, I'm not a big fan of looking at raw LED. Um, I think that the, the actual contrast of the single dot is really harsh and kind of hurts your eyeball. Um, so in Terrell Place, we have a diffusion screen that is pulled across the whole thing. And people are always like, How, where is this coming from? Like, it's just, it's magic, because it just floats in space. Um, and it actually, because the type of diffusion screen, the, the bright lights, um, when they hit the, the surface that's two inches in front of it, it actually catches that light. And so bright things sit on the front surface and dark things sit back. And so you get a real wonderful depth. Uh, so um, you know, with super high resolution LED, we're, we're starting to get stuff that's a little bit nicer to get close to. Uh, but for the lower resolution, diffusion is really nice. As far as software, um, we use a lot of different tools. Uh, we use for, uh, for Previs, uh, we've been using a lot with the Unreal Engine. Um, the, uh, uh, for our actual generative software, we've been using Touch Designer or Cinder, or there's a company up in Montreal at, uh, called Float4 that does some interesting work. So there's a lot of software tools out there that are made for doing generative and dynamic systems. And that's what actually we use both for, for our uh, design, but also for our uh, implementation. And then as far as changing media, um, I think uh, we, we do change and update content. Um, I think that what, we're, what our goal is to do is to understand the pacing of the space right so that there isn't an expectation for constant change. If you put something on the wall that's changing every 30 seconds, then if you see the same thing 100 times and it's changing every 30 seconds, you're going to expect it to be changing. Where if those cherry blossoms are on for the whole day and they kind of shift and change, and when you come down at lunchtime, they're a little bit different than they were in the morning, and you know, you, 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 you know that when you stand there, the butterflies all come out, it becomes something that is um, 
it's, it's more dynamic and it's this piece of art and there's a less of an expectation for change. And so we'll create scenes that are specific for like holidays or for events that you know, really make a clear demarcation that there is a, a shift in that community uh, and, and those are moments for change and, and that we'll often work with the client to figure out what are the right moments for that. Uh, but I think for the most part we try to create systems that can have two, three years without a, a refresh of content. Other questions? Yeah. Michael, could you talk a little bit about, I heard you say in the past that there's blending between lighting design and media design happening, and would you relate that to how you work with different resolutions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, it's one of the things, I remember when we worked on a Shanghai uh, corporate pavilion, we worked with an amazing lighting designer, and um, uh, from Full Flood, Bobby Dickinson, and I remember we were walking through the space and we had this realization that uh, it was that actually, ooh, people look really bad in front of all this technology. Uh, and people, all they do now is take selfies. So how are we gonna create a space that people look really good and we can still, still activate our walls with technology? And there's this kind of aha moment of, uh, yeah, we think of this as a content delivery system, but it's like, it's light. Right? Like that's really what it is. It's, it's, it's light and it's something that's physical. So I think part of our practice is to really understand our media screens as all three of those things, as a physical object, as something that emits light and adds to the light of the space, and something that can deliver content. Um, and so you know, we're always thinking about what is the rest of the architectural lighting doing how do we tie into it? How do we make that part of our media canvas so that it is a continuous experience throughout the space? Yes. Sure. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. Uh, I've actually been to a couple of buildings. In really? Where, 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 there, I work a couple of blocks from the Terrell Place. Oh, cool. So I was just wondering if there's anything that you're currently working on in your office that you find maybe uh, exciting Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll just spill all our corporate secrets out here. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that one of the things that's really exciting that we're working on right now is in these same type of spaces where we've kind of activated these common spaces in commercial buildings, thinking about how to take it to that next level where um, we can really offer uh, an extension of the work environment. Um, I, I think um, not, not to diverge too far, but you know, there's this idea of the work workspace and, and home space, and then there's like this third space, which is the, the place of community or socialization, and I think that there's this real shift of that third space moving towards the work environment that we're seeing. And so how do you take these, uh, these common spaces and even put more programming and more opportunity in them for, um, for all the people within the building and the community to be able to come together and make a more authentic uh, community environment. So that's something that I, I think we're pretty excited about uh, and are working really hard on. Um, I think the other big project is right now we are uh, reimagining a, a cultural center for the future. Um, and so um, thinking about how you can, uh, you know, what does a, what does a, a Lincoln Center look like for eight years from now, but something that's gonna attract living culture, uh, something that's going to uh, excite people that are 16 and excite people that are, are 75, um, and uh, are filled with people that are not just uh, performers, but also are, are the audience are doers. And, and I think actually this, this presentation talks a little bit about that. Because um, one of the exciting things in all of this creation is that the tool is really a computer. And so everybody, you know, everybody is growing up with the tool in their lap. So, um, you know, just like 
it's, it's almost like you imagine going to a, a, a chamber music concert and everybody in the audience is also a string player. Um, it's like you could go to uh, an event that's a digital media event and everybody has a laptop in the audience. So there's this opportunity for the, the separation between the, um, the audience and the performers to start shrinking. And so that's something that we're exploring and are pretty excited about. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, we've talked. A, we've, we've explored the residential space. Um, it, it's really a matter of scale, and it's it's a scale and cost challenge there. Um, and I think that where we are seeing residential is becoming a real opportunity is in. Uh, these mixed-use developments. I think we're seeing a lot of kind of mixed and hyper-mixed use where you have residential, you have work, you have retail, all kind of in the same complex. And in those opportunities, there's a real need uh, because in effect, you're creating a new city. <laughs> you know, like you're, you're putting in all the pieces of like a little mini village. And so you really have to figure out how to weave an identity into that village. And so a lot of the work that we do is really thinking about what does that town square look like? And so in, uh, in developments like that, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it just hasn't gotten to the scale yet. Uh, it will. It, you know, this stuff will eventually become the new, the new JIT board, uh, and people will be able to just specify it to go on the walls. It just hasn't gotten there yet. Yeah? I'm sure you could ask me now. So um, we've been very fortunate. We have, we've got amazing clients that really trust in us and, and um, believe in us. But at the same time, every project that we've touched of theirs has brought in a huge ROI. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, there's a huge tech, uh, uh, tech company that's moving into Terrell Place that's taking up a lot of the floors. And it all happened because of, of this wall there. Um, and when we're working with the client, especially developers, we're also working with their, all the brokers that are going to be out um, understanding how they can position this property. And so uh, it's, it's, been kind of a, it's been kind of amazing. I and mean, part of it's definitely the market, but the other part of it is um, they're really able to create a building that stands out in, in a potential um, tenant's mind. And it's... it's, it's I mean, I've been surprised by how successful it's been. Um, so for them, for this client, I think they understand it because we've done uh, over 30 buildings with them over the last five years. Um, I think that some of the other developers are still having to learn and get on board. But you know, realistically, they're competing with um, big tech campuses and WeWorks. And they're not going to be able to stay competitive in, in this type of building if they don't offer an exciting uh, environment. So I think that's, that's changing quickly. Yeah. Um, I think we, we adapt our design depending on the, the environment. So you know this uh, this piece over here is actually um, was design is designed and installed in a lobby, um, the PNC Bank in Pittsburgh in their headquarters, and it's the, the, it was the greenest building in America, and it is an incredibly low power installation where we're using these custom kind of privacy glass pieces with just a few LEDs in a way that. Um, it takes almost no electricity, but creates a big impact. And it is actually tied into the 
the building management system and reflects the, the pulse and the flow of the, um, how environmental the building is being. So you can actually see how the heat is moving through the building, which floors are ventilating, and all of the, the story of the um, actual in, environmental component of the building. And so, you know, in a lot of um, spaces, this is a communication tool, a way that the building can speak. And so if the, the story is about uh, it's saving energy, that's a story that, that we're very excited to craft and use the right tools uh, to be true to that story. Um, so it, it depends on the application. Again, this is a very low power application here where we're just using light and we're using the existing concrete surface as the reflector. Um, there's things that take up more energy, but I mean, I think that even in the most, uh, you know, in Terrell Place, it's not taking up more energy than a couple of elevators to run. You know, like, so it's, it, it is definitely electricity, but it's not um, bigger than any of like the core uh, components that are making the fabric of the building. Uh, so it's, it's on, it seems like it's on par there. But uh, there's also been a lot of advancement in, in this technology and that we're pushing hard to, to create technology that is just more efficient as well. Yeah. Um, you know, actually, in the in the big mall project that that we we I was showing you in in Chicago, um, their MEP was excited that we were introducing heat there because it was a, a place that um, they were having trouble with circulation, and so. I don't, we haven't explicitly done it, um, but it seems like it's been useful in, in some of these cases. But it, it, we do work tightly with, with MEPs to figure out the best way to create the flow of air that makes the most sense for the building. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we have. I Do don't think, think we have. A real possibility? I think it will be. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it is right now. I mean, the, 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 the challenge with all this stuff is that we really, we think of these as permanent installations, meaning 10 years, let's say. Um, and so something that is mechanical like that or something that has that level of um, like cutting edge technology, I think is, is too risky to put in something that's gonna to have to last for 10 years. And so there's this really interesting balance that we have to take between um, you know, using cutting edge technology, using stuff that is more uh, kinetic and creating something that's durable, that's not gonna get a lot of maintenance in a space like this, that's gonna get abuse. Um, and so I think that's also part of, uh, it, it hasn't happened yet. But I think, I w I think probably in the next five years, When a developer comes to you and invests, like, make everything, or, you know, like, you know, what are the briefs that you receive for some of these larger, more ambient pieces, and you know, how do you begin a project like that? Um, so usually the developer comes to us, they say, uh, we've got this lobby, it needs to be cool, um, <laughs> and uh, go figure it out. And then we, our whole team will go, a core group of our team will go to the site and we'll meet with all the different stakeholders. Uh, we'll meet with the uh, building management who knows their tenants. We'll meet with the broker community who knows their target, uh, their target tenants. Uh, we'll walk around the neighborhood and understand the, the different uh, sight lines of the building. Uh, we'll get some of the story of the neighborhood and then our team goes back and we go and we say, this wall here uh, seems like it's the place that we could have uh, an amazing like, environmental activation. And over here, we could put in something that's really informational that makes it a much more dynamic experience as you're waiting for the elevator. Because we heard from the building management that people wait a long time for the elevator and they need something that's going to be uh, engaging them in a little bit more. And so we, we, we kind of lay out a story uh, of just you know, color blocking out walls using some precedent. And then we, we show that story back to the, the client. 
And then through a dialogue, we kind of get down to the core parameters of what we're activating and what the story is that we're telling. And then we get into the, the details of how that actually uh, comes to life. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, so the question is, is are these um, exempt from the energy requirements? Um, yes, most of them are. So they're, um, depending on the, the city, depending on the code, um, in a number of these places, they've been considered as, as parts of public art. Uh, in, in Denver, that, the big wall um, with the big stripes on it was considered you know, Denver's largest public art installation. And actually, a lot of the Denver community really rallied around it and were excited by it. Uh, it featured a lot of feeds and images from local artists. Um, and so it was a way to kind of become a, a, a centerpiece of, of Denver and become ex an exciting part of that, the art there. So that's some of the things that we've done um, in a lot of the spaces, is seeing a bit more as art than in, in lighting. Yeah. Um, they, I would say that the fastest one is probably 10 months from start to completion, and typically it's more like a year to 18 months. One more question? One more question, yeah. So I think actually almost all of the buildings that we've worked in are LEED certified, and um, a lot of them it was before. Um, because this is classified as uh, either signage or art, it falls outside of the, the LEED certification requirements. So we haven't. So. Michael, but, thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I invite you all, let's continue the conversation. I invite you all to a reception that's happening in our 69th Street Gallery right around the corner. So I hope to see you all there. And thank you again. And thank you for coming. Thank you.